thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> um, I titled today's talk, which is basically just I'm going to talk about straw bale construction, some of the positive uh, points about it, and show pictures of um, our uh, the house that we built here in Urbana. Um, I subtitled it A Path to Sustainability, and that's because um, I believe that that it is a path, but it's not the path. Um, the kinds of issues and challenges that we face as a country and as a planet and as a species uh, are going to require uh, not an either or solution, but rather a both and solution. Every different aspect of our lives is going to have to come under scrutiny. Uh, what we eat, what we wear, how we travel, how we entertain ourselves, as well as the types of buildings that we live in and how we heat and cool those buildings. It's all got to come under scrutiny if we ever hope to meet the challenges that, that lie before us. So uh, it's with um, putting the, it all into straw bale construction within that context and in that perspective that I present these things to you this morning. Um, one of the things that I want to say about straw bale construction and one of the reasons that I'm so uh, excited about it is that in terms of a building method, it's definitely not rocket science. It's reasonably low tech. Um, people that do not have previous building skills can still participate in the buildings of straw bale houses and structures. Um, so it invites a community in to participate. Also, it's simple enough that people that are already in the trades um, can easily take the skills they already have and apply it to straw bale building and find success there. So it isn't a big far far cry. Um, you can take people that are skilled and they'll make a better building than people that are unskilled, obviously, but it's all quite accessible. And then when you're done and you have your building, it's not only uh, energy efficient, it's beautiful. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say, too, though, is that you can build a straw bale house and it can it can be not particularly energy efficient, and not particularly sustainable. It, there has to be a lot of things that come together to make the whole entire package more green, more sustainable, more energy efficient. And um, to that end, I want to pass these around so that you all can have a list in front of you. This is a list of some of the features in the house that we have in Urbana can just pass one and take it around. Also, uh, while I'm thinking about it, I'll mention that I have a list. Uh, if anybody wants to pursue their education in straw bale construction further, um, you can take one of these as you leave. It's a list of straw bale information sources. It includes uh, different books and publishers, different websites and publications, uh, and also uh, associations that you can belong to if you're so inclined. So I'll just put that right up here, and uh, somebody can you know, whoever wants can take one at the end. <clears throat> As we mentioned, uh, building with straw is energy efficient. Uh, typically, in a straw bale wall, you're going to get an R34 to an R55, depending on a lot of different things, how the straw is packed, how thick the wall is, um, how tight the construction is. But it is definitely uh, much higher of an R value than you would get in a standardly uh, insulated 2x4 or 2x6 frame wall. Also, uh, straw bale walls, when they're built, after they're uh, covered with either plaster or stucco, are very, um, very, very strong. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there's an opportunity because of the simple, the simplicity of putting the walls together that you can get your fr family and friends together to help you build your house, which also, besides community building and having a great time and a fun time together, um, it also cuts down the cost of construction. Using straw is also um, using a, a low energy embodied material because the first product of straw is some kind, of, usually typically some kind of grain crop. So what you're taking and using to build your house with has been grown already for a different purpose, and you're basically dealing with an agricultural waste product. So you're getting two uses instead of one off of off of something, which is a really good principle. And as I mentioned here before, um, 
it's a very high R value in the walls. Also, straw is a natural product, so you don't have to worry about um, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, any kind of off-gassing of formaldehyde-based glues, uh, any, any kind of things like that. So for people who have health problems, uh, allergies, that type of thing, um, it, 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 in terms of chemical allergies, formaldehydes, urea compounds, that type of thing, it's a very healthy option. And um, I know that there's probably you've heard about the, 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 them being problems with mold or mildew. That can happen with any house regardless of what you build with. And if you do a good job in your construction and a good job in your detailing and a good, good job in your design, there shouldn't be any problem with mold or mildew. Also, and I put this in here too, um, there, you can finish the walls with a variety of materials. Uh, lime plaster, cement stucco are two very popular uh, uh, choices, but also earthen plaster is another uh, good choice, I feel, particularly on the interior where you don't have to worry about constant pelting of rain and snow and sleet and that kind of thing. And the great thing about an earthen plaster is that you can use the the, the overdig from your foundation, that once you get the clay, you can make your plasters out of that. So it doesn't have to be hauled away to a different site, and it actually goes right back into the building. It's, you know, there's no um, chemicals in that. Um, you add sand and you add straw, all natural uh, ingredients, and you have your earthen plaster to finish off the insides of your walls. You can actually finish them in a way that it doesn't need to be painted at all. Um, what I found is chopping straw very finely and the final coat of earthen plaster, and then it goes on like a clay, waiting till it's leather hard and then buffing it with a damp rag, takes the cream off of the plaster and raises the little flecks of golden straw, and it's just extremely beautiful. People would pay top dollar to have their house finished like that, and, and you can get it, and, and then it doesn't even need to be painted, so it also saves labor that way as well. The stucco and the plaster, in addition, help hold the heat and the cool in the building, so it also contributes to the overall performance of the building. In addition, the height to width ratio of a straw bale wall makes it more resistant to earthquakes um, because it's, the, it's a wider wall, and also straw is a really good shock absorber. Um, when those two earthquakes hit earlier, later, earlier this year, a little while ago, maybe it was last year, our whole family, including the dogs and the cats, slept through it. We did, had no idea that it even happened, where a lot of people said that they woke up in the, in the early morning hours and they knew that, you know, they knew that something had gone amiss because they heard their windows rattling or they felt their bed shake. There was nothing like that in our house. We slept right through, which is in our house, it's saying a lot to sleep right through anything, actually. Um, also, a plastered or stuccoed uh, wall will give you a two-hour firewall. So it's, it's more resistant to fire. I think the current codes are 20 minutes. Isn't that right? For a residential application, 20 minute firewall. Yeah, something like that. Or at least no more than an hour. And you can come up with a, if you use cement stucco, the lateral force loads on the wall and the compressive force loads are well in excess of any existing code requirements. So you have a really <laughs> strong structure. As I mentioned, it's, it's pretty much stacking bales is about as simple as stacking, uh, stacking bricks. And so it's fairly easy to do. And you can get your friends together or not, depends on what you want to do there, and put it all together. But it's fairly simple. Also, in doing this, you would, if you can get your straw locally, which I highly recommend, you're helping to support ag the agriculture economy in an in a environmentally responsible and, and sustainable way. I added up how much my bales cost me, including shipping and, you know, all of that business, and did a cost comparison because, uh, for per square foot what it would cost to, to basically insulate a wall with as much insulation and use the amount of studs that you would need to use in order to get that thick of a wall to get you know, basically, you know, insulated, drywall on the inside, sheathing on the outside, no siding. I didn't figure that in as well, but, but the just the dollar amount per square foot compared with around one dollar for the straw bales uh, and three dollars and forty one cents for a standard construction with the same R value. Now you make up for a lot of that in the labor of the plastering, but 
um, it's still pretty remarkable that it would be that inexpensive. Also, with bales, um, you're not you're not as confined to doing corners, uh, you know, sharp corners as you would be, say, in a stud walls. So you can make curves more easily, and you can also take a chainsaw or what they call a lancelot, which is a grinder, a, a round chainsaw on, stuck onto a four inch, uh, four and a half inch grinding wheel, and you can carve into the bales. You can do kinds of sculptural things. So it, the, uh, it has a lot of flexibility in terms of your design. And if you want, I've seen, I saw one where somebody put a j uh, tr circular saw on a jig, and they put it up against a bale wall, and they moved the, the circular saw up and down the jig as they went down the straw bale wall so that when they were done, they had a perfectly flat, smooth, straight wall to plaster because they didn't like the, you know, well, what you see here, this sort of waviness, you know, that little wave and that curve right there. Eh, they didn't want any of that stuff. They wanted it to be just dead on, perfect, straight up and down. I don't, I can't imagine it personally, but that's what they wanted. So you can actually go from something very modern and angular to something really biomorphic. Um, a lot of uh, what you're going to see here uh, are also on your sheets. So you can refer back to your sheets if you're, if uh, you forget or, uh, you know, you want to refer to it again. Um, these are some of the aspects of the house in Urbana that go together to make it an uh, what I would say a, a more sustainable and definitely more energy efficient house. For the foundation, which is a full basement, we used the product called Rastra, and uh, it is made, it's an insulated concrete form that gives us about an R34 in a 10 inch wall. It's, it has 85% post consumer recycled material. So it's 85% recycled styrofoam and 15% concrete admixture. And then we filled it with a, there's rebar in uh, in the matrix, and we filled it with a like an eight or nine slump pour concrete that had a fairly high composition of fly ash. And that's also a post-consumer uh, waste product. Uh, so the concrete itself, even though it was concrete, it was a little bit more environmentally friendly than it might normally have been. We also used rye straw bales, that's the kind I wanted because they have a little bit higher silica content, so they're a little bit better for building. And um, we got those from an organic farmer, so we were also supporting organic agriculture at the same time. He lives uh, down near Sturzen, Illinois. I actually ended up using two different farmers. Uh, one is the or or organic and uh, the other one is a dairy farmer who has a, also a winery. So he needs, he grows rye for his grapevines. But they were both very gracious in selling me their bales. I appreciated it very much. Also, in the ceiling of the straw bale, we have uh, uh, blown-in cellulose, which is basically recycled newspaper. It's a great product. I love blown-in cellulose. It's good high R value, and you're using something that's already been. It's a, you know, waste product. I, it's just wonderful. And we also reclaimed uh, the maple floor in our great room in the biggest part of the upstairs was uh, a maple floor in the old Seidel Elementary School that was being torn down. That's one of those things that you live and learn. Uh, won't be doing that again. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we some of that, that recycled stuff makes good sense, and some of it doesn't. And I'm here to tell you, don't try it at home. Um, but it's a beautiful floor, and I do love it, and I wouldn't trade it. We also put bamboo floors in our bedrooms. Uh, having experienced the great room floor, we put bamboo floors in the bedrooms because that's a Quicker turnaround, three years, three to eight years on bamboo as opposed to maple or oak floors. And we used a lot of reclaimed wood that we got from the Preservation and Conservation Association. We would take, uh, get old yellow pine baseboards and we'd turn them into the jams and the stops for all the first floor interior doors. Um, we also got the interior doors from pr the Preservation and Conservation Association. And some of those doors actually came from Harker Hall. So you'll see pictures here coming up of old Harker Hall doors. Maybe you'll feel a little bit warm, fuzzy, or something when you see the picture. In, in addition, um, the countertops, as you can see here in the kitchen, there these are old chalkboards right here. And they were about three eighths of an inch thick, and they were, had to be sort of composited and laminated together. And the island is about a three quarter inch piece of reclaimed slate that was an old bathroom partition in a high school. 
We also used um, uh, Trex as the back porch flooring, which is 100% recycled material, and Tendura on the front porch flooring, which is also 100% recycled porch flooring material. We have a high-efficiency forced air gas furnace, and uh, we used that the first year. And then the second year, we got a corn stove for our lower level, and we started using our wood stove in the upper level, and our basically our gas uh, furnace hasn't gone on for the last two years. Um, and we also have low E for all the windows, the skylights, the doors, that type of thing, low E glass. Um, we tried to use engineering, uh, engineered lumber as much as possible. Uh, this beam, whoops, I'm sorry. Get back there. This beam right here, the header beam, that's the main bearing beam that goes around the whole perimeter of the house is engineered lumber. And then the, you can see trusses here, which make use of small dimension lumber rather than large dimension lumber. We also have TJIs in the floor package. Um, that's engineered as well. Then on the first floor, because we, it's really important for in straw bale to have a vapor permeability, whereas it's sort of counterintuitive in, in stick frame construction, you don't want vapor permeability, but in straw you do. So you couldn't put a regular latex paint on the bale walls. So we may actually made our own paints out of wheat paste, clay, mica dust, and colorants. So all the colors that you see in our, were actually formulated by us. And you can see a little bit of a picture there. There's the, right there's the bamboo. The bamboo. There's the truss system. Sort of the, this'll, the, these next shots here are just sort of the process of construction. So I'll try to sort of glide through them. If you have any questions, well, I'm flipping through here. Just feel free to ask them. Um, upstairs, inside or outside? It's about it's about a 2,000 square foot footprint. On upstairs, we have about 15 to 1,600 square feet of living space, and downstairs, it's you know 17 or 1,800 because the walls upstairs are thicker than the walls downstairs. So, and then we have a garage studio, and it's a little under a thousand square feet total on the outside. As you can see right here is a good shot of the rostra. And there's the inside of the great room prior to anything. <laughs> you can see there's a little, uh, you see there's a little orange mark right there and maybe a little bit one right there. I went through and decided where I wanted my receptacles, my electrical receptacles in the wall and shot it with spray paint. And then I went through with my little Lancelot and cut the trenches and the bo and the holes in the straw, and then I made up all the boxes and put them in. So my, my electrician didn't want to have anything to do with it, so I I ended up doing all, doing all of them. Did it just float in the straw, or how do you, how do you give it security? I took a like a two-by-four and cut a little wedge off to make like a pointy two-by-two, two, and then I actually hammered that into the straw so that I would basically have a have something to screw the box into at the back, and I – took some, um, uh, it's not Greenfield, but it's the uh, piping for, uh, you know, it's plastic instead of metal conduit. It's basically plastic conduit and made up the boxes and put them in and then, you know, screwed them in there. And it, wherever they were, then he could just rough it in like it was a regular stud wall. But wherever they were a little bit, um, you know, wobbly, if they ended up being wobbly, what I found worked the best was to take some great stuff and spray it around the outside of the box. It would go into the straw, expand into the straw, and expand around the box, and it was solid as all get out when the whole thing was said and done. Did you have any trouble with getting buildings from there and building inspectors? No, I didn't, but I started talking to the folks in Urbana two or three years before we actually built. And, oh, just so everybody knows here, Christine Shalafu was the architect on this project, and she was wonderful to work with, and I think she did a fabulous job. And the city did Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Christine also, you know, any questions they had, she was, well, you know, very happy to ask, answer the questions. And so it worked out great. They were, it, it was, it was a good, it was a good experience altogether. Yes, as opposed to load bearing, it's infill. And one of the reasons that we did that was because if we went to infill as, a, as opposed to load bearing, I did not have to get an alternative building permit. This was this was done under a standard building permit. 
because it's not the straw is not taking up the load. So all the structural tests and all that business did not we didn't have to go there. So for the first for the first building, that's what I wanted to do. Make it the process that whole permitting process as simple as possible. So the framework is where? Um, let's see, yeah, the, you see these posts right here? Yeah. The, the beam actually, all that beam that goes around the perimeter is, you know, these posts are carrying the load and it does on all the other walls too. And where the, the straw meets those, we just notch the straw. And it just slipped right in there. How are the windows supported? Um, let's see, how are the windows supported? Right, the windows are between each of the columns, and I think we put a two by four, you know, from the header down to the sill plate, and then put a very simple buck, you know, top and bottom, and then that's what the, it just, the window just goes in that hole. Then we ended up having to infill. Um, I don't know if it, this, well, you can see some of the truss system there, and that's basically the beam and the truss system, a little bit of the rostra. We'll come up to, and you can see here in this situation how the windows are sitting to the outside, they're all being, they're all held in a two by four kind of situation. Um, and then flash just like you would, you know, you can see the flashing, the window tape and stuff, the flashing around there. On the inside, it's a little bit different and I'll, and I'll try to address that when I come to that. You can see a little bit closer idea of that right there. These are some um, shots of the stuccoing. We did, did, have to do a lot to prep for the stucco, so we prep for the stucco. We actually use what they call a stucco gun or a stu stucco pump. It has about a 50-foot uh, long hose, and there's somebody mixing the stucco and then bringing it to this pump, putting it in the hopper, and then it gets fed through. And, and two advantages are that you can have a very small crew of people to get the stucco done, and also, it has it shoots with a lot of velocity, so the penetration of the stucco into the straw is really amplified, which ultimately makes the house a lot stronger. The more penetration you get, the better, the the stronger the wall is. And you'll see here that you see that grid there. That's like some galvanized fencing, heavy-duty galvanized fencing. We didn't use it on the inside at all because we discovered we didn't have to. Plus. The existence of that actually um, cuts down on the load strength, the compressive and the lateral load strength of the walls because it doesn't allow, where any place that there's one of those little lines, it doesn't allow for the stucco to penetrate the straw. So it actually cuts down on the strength of the wall. Well, yeah, I mean, to keep the, to keep the bales true and to have something to sort of sew uh, the bales to, it's really good to at least do it on one side. Yeah, it just stabilizes it up quite a bit. There we are, you know, sh here, there's Eric, he's shooting some stucco, and there we are troweling it in, troweling it smooth. We basically discovered that we need a crew of about five people, and you can make really good progress in one day if you use a stucco pump. If you have 20 people, stucco pumps don't make any make any sense whatsoever. You've got all the arms and all the legs. If you've got all the trowels, put them to work. That's what I say. And there's a picture of our beloved stucco pump. Well, we didn't always think it was beloved. If it, if it, yeah, we, it was also accursed, but. Yeah, we basically, that was just, no, we took that off. Um, we, that was just basically to keep the bales dry till it was time to stucco. It also, um, <clears throat> we got in a little bit of a trouble with the fire department. Um, so they, they said we had all the bales and they were, you know, you build your roof first. And so you have this like picnic pavilion. So we brought the bales and they could sit under there and stay dry. Well, the fire guys go by our house all the time because they get stuff at Schnooks. So they happened to see the, that, you know, those bales there and they stopped and said, you can't have those there. It's a fire hazard. They said, well, we said, well, we're going to just put them out here to the wall. Well, that's different. Then it's a wall. But if it's in a pile, it's a fire hazard. So we said, okay. So then we put Tyvek up all around so you couldn't see in anymore. <laughs> did I say, could I just admit to that? Well, well, he was just, what he was afraid of is if, so, if it did, if somebody did, ar you know, arson and they, like, they would have, you would have to put, uh, uh, 
what do you call it, a, a, an accelerant or something, a gasoline or something, in order to really get it going. But once you did, he was afraid that, that he wouldn't be able to get the fire out and it would hit the other houses and that kind of thing. So, so we just put Tyvek up. And then it keeps people, you know, curious people off the job site and that kind of thing. But when we went to stucco, yes, we had to take it off. But it may be something to consider. <coughs> if you look at your timeline of construction, when the start harvested, it would be probably ideal to have a place to store it for the extended period of time that's away from other residences. Yes. They, yeah. And we, we actually did, we, you know, they had it, we stored it at the farmer's place until it was just pretty much almost time for us to do it. And then we brought it up. Yeah. And then that's the, that's the uh, cement mixer we used for the stucco. And we're doing some ha hand troweling now on the rostra because it didn't make sense to spray it. We didn't need that much mix, really. You can see the raw rostra there, and then it. And that's the one. That's one of the other reasons we chose the rostra. It's a perfect substrate for accepting plaster with, you know, no adaptations whatsoever. You just spray it with water to pre-wet it, and you stucco it or plaster it. It was. It's really a fantastic product that way. In the rostra part? Um, there's some cracking, but it's not anything major. Certainly no failing at all. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can patch it in. It's interesting because where the the crack pattern is ex everywhere we have a post, and I think it's because of the de the difference of the depth of the stucco. I, at least I guess that that's what it is. I'm not sure. But like I said, their hairline cracks. It's not that big of a deal. So I, it would actually look worse for me to patch it, I think, than it would for me to just leave it alone. You can sort of see this is the, pro, I, don't, I think it's the second coat of stucco before we do our color coat, which is very, very thin, maybe a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch thin. You can, you certainly could, but you want to seal your bales because that's really important from a fire and a structural point of view. So then anything you do over the top of that is, is extra work and extra materials. Does that, if that makes sense? So that's our studio garage here. You'll see a picture of the studio after it's completed. This is, uh, the outside of the studio and then this is the inside. Which, No, they're not. They're not either. They're not there. I think we turned the bales a different way. We were just trying experiments to see. We started the. We actually started this structure first, and finished it last. Um, but we, in here, by the time, like I said, we finished it last. We were like, let's get it done. So um, we wanted it as simple as possible. So the finish on the straw walls is not nearly as so pristine. And I actually used just made a basic lime wash for all of the straw walls. That's a. That's a d drywall wall, um, and then these are the straw, and it's sort of a textural finish, like what we call a broom finish, literally hitting it with a broom to rough it up a little bit, and then washing it with lime wash. Here's another shot of the studio. I I'm sorry. I'm... Can you speak louder? I, I Well, I did as much. did as much research as I possibly could. Um, I read books. I subscribed to an online worldwide journal so that people were writing in about their problems and other people were answering them. And then I also uh, uh, helped people do straw bale in Arizona and Iowa. So. I tried to get as much experience as I could and, you know, but the, the problem with going to books is that by the time the book is written, the way this, this particular technology is developing is so rapid that almost every book that's there is out of, out of date. So the online journal is extremely helpful because they're, you know, doing, and also publications like The Last Straw, that's much more up to date. People are writing in and letting you know what worked and what didn't and, Five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, here's the problem and here's what I think we need to do to correct it. So 
This is a picture from the backyard, and it's, you know, still a work in progress, our house. But, um, you know, you can see. Huh? It looks great. Well, thanks. And then you can see here uh, that now we've made a little bit more progress because we also have our, our outdoor kitchen is here now. Um, the earthen oven is here. Can't see it, but there's a clothesline there. We got the patio, a patio finished. Patios are typically considered to be more green than decks, let's say. What's the um, stone? Uh, I believe it's Pennsylvania bluestone. I think. Picture of our back of our porch. No, well, there, well, yeah, I've got an indoor kitchen. You'll get to see a picture of the indoor kitchen. I certainly prefer cooking indoors at this time of year. <laughs> Actually, I really prefer it because if I use my oven or whatever, it really helps keep the house toasty. And then um, these are just, you know, different little uh, design features that we put into the uh, to the stucco wall. Um, and they're little sentimental shells and rocks. When when we go on vacation, instead of, you know, getting the snow globe or whatever, we bring back a bunch of rocks usually. So some of those are from different vacations and different sentimental trips, and we and put those in the house. This is a picture of the, ah, the indoor kitchen. <laughs> Look, she has one, yes. Um, and right there, there's the reclaimed floor and the reclaimed countertops. Yeah. Yeah, the the outdoor kitchen was sort of a I wanted an earthen oven because I wanted an earthen oven. So I built the earthen oven. Then I realized I really needed to put a roof of some kind over the earthen oven and then I said, "Well, while I'm at it, why don't I just make myself a little outdoor kitchen?" And as it turned out, it's great because it's sort of like camping except you can sleep in your own bed at night and it also helps keep um, keep the heat in the summertime out of the house and, you know, reducing like not using the dryer and not using the stove really helps me not have to use my air conditioning <coughs> for much, much longer period of time. So, it, oh, yeah, and I have great bread. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, I it's all part of an electrical bill. I probably used my air conditioning two to three weeks this year. So, yeah, we had some hot spells, but uh, and then this is another picture. We have these like, little open what we call chiways in the house, and uh, all the, the the jam around that is all reclaimed yellow pine. Um, but it sort of opens up the kitchen space to the rest of the house, and you'll see other examples of that. More, more kitchen, more kitchen, and this is one of those examples when I'm standing. And what I would consider to be the middle of my house or the heart of my home, which is in front of my stove, I can look to the left and see outside of my backyard. I can look up and see to the, to the sky from through my skylight. And I can look to my right to the north and see through the hall and to the glass window where the foyer is. And right beyond that, that little dark spot right there is my truth window, which is an open space in the wall. That's got a nice frame around it and a piece of glass on it. It's a tradition in straw bale building that you leave one section unplastered to prove that you have an authentic straw bale house. That's called the truth window. So I can look through at, when I'm in the heart of my home, I can, I can check myself and see, yes, yes, Dorothy, you really are here. You're really home. Well, I think personally to, to, unless you're using them specifically and you've got it designed as a passive solar gain, which is possible. Otherwise, I would try to keep my total window to wall ratio no more than 10%. That's what, that's what has been, has been recommended to me. Then you might be able to go up higher, but I'm not sure what, what that would be. Yeah. And then this is the great room, and there's a the little wood stove that we actually now use to heat the whole upstairs. Yeah, we have ceiling fans. There's one big one in the great room, and then we have them in the bedrooms as well. We re we use them a lot, and window fans rather than you know using the AC. This is the hallway where the laundry area is. 
got a roll down bamboo screen there. I think that that helps make that whole that basically turns half of the, the, ha the hallway into half of the laundry room without having anything that protrudes into the hallway. There's a picture of our bathroom. We, we smooth plastered in there and all of these paints here, all the interior walls, which are all drywall, stud walls with drywall and um, a skim coat of plaster over them. And then this here is the straw bale wall and we have clay paint on it. Uh, it's slate. So you mentioned earlier in, in the bathroom the moisture issue. That, why is it that it needs to breathe? Why do the straw bales need to be permeable? If, there, if there's vapor, you don't want the vapor to be caught and hanging inside the straw. You want it to be able to move. Another great thing about the clay paints is that it, it will absorb moisture. Whenever you take a shower or a bath or whatever, this wall here gets all blotchy looking, changes colors, and it, it, the, the paint itself grabs the moisture, holds it, and then slowly releases it into the atmosphere. So instead of having dripping walls, you've got something that's actually helping to work with you to hold the moisture and then rel uh, basically mo modulate the relative humidity of the room. It's a really, it's a nice little feature. You know, the downside is that they're not very washable. So every once in a while after a while, you're going to have to repaint because it's going to look, start looking kind of cruddy. Ah, there's the other end of our bathroom. And look, there's room, it's room 218. That's, that's the door, one of the doors that came from Harker Hall. <laughs> there's another door, reclaimed door, and that's another bedroom. And uh, all the windowsills in the upstairs of the house are made out of wild cherry. My dad had this tree cut down in a piece of timber that our family owns, and he had it milled for me for to use however I wanted to when we built the house. He was very excited. So we've been living in the house for more than three years, and I swear every time um, every time he comes, I think he takes his video camera and just takes another shot of the <laughs> windowsills. It's it's really sweet. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad he liked what we did with them. And this is another. You can see the the clay paints here. We actually tried. You can see it's a little bit more modeled. Uh, finish. We actually tried lin putting linseed oil on the on the paint to see if we could make it a little bit more washable. It, it didn't really work. So, but I kind of like the way it looks. Now they're just pictures of to the stairs to the down to the basement or the lower level. No, well, I call the first floor the where the part where we live, which is what you're seeing right here, and it's two basically two bedrooms, a bathroom, the laundry, and a great room, which is kitchen, dining, living room, with a small front porch and a larger back porch. That's the the front, and then downstairs, it's pretty much two bedrooms, which are larger, a bathroom, and then uh, underneath the great room basically is where our company offices are. Here's another picture of the great room. You can see this, the, what I was going to say about the windows. You can see here how they're sort of curved. Well, the, the, the posts are out in here someplace, and then the bucks are tighter around the window. So all of this area had to be basically filled in by hand with loose straw and, and held with chicken wire. That's sort of how we got that look. A lot of stuffing. And uh, this is my last picture, so I'll leave it here. This is a picture of the front of the house. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Did you mention lots of, lots of change that developed in three years? So again, how would this house be different? If I did it again, and I wasn't as much of a, I mean, if I, knowing, you know, you have to just go with what you know at the time. But um, I think I would be a little braver about going ahead and doing lime plaster on the exterior and earthen plaster on the interior. interior. I think I'd really want to do that because I feel like, those walls are more breathable, and because we have a, a non-load-bearing house, then the, the strength that you're going to get with a cement stucco doesn't, isn't as big of a factor. And, you know, Christine, you can, I, I welcome your comments, you know, and you can feel the pipe in anytime you want with what your opinion about it is. I think some of the conservativeness 
in this was due to me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I remember quite a few arguments about what type of plaster to use and um, uh, considering my name was on the drawing. <laughs> uh, and with some of the details of how we put it together, um, you know, I had to be more conservative. I've certainly never done a straw mill house either. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think, you know, the way we supported the bales on the inside on the joists, we were very conservative. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think right. having done it now, you know, we know a little bit more about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Well, I, this is another thing I should mention, and this doesn't address your question at all, but but uh, when, you know, in, in terms of heating and cooling systems and all of that business, you know, we wanted it to be as mainstream as possible. We wanted it to be as, you know, you know, ordinary Joe type as possible because we didn't want it to be so out there that nobody would, everybody would think, we can't, can't, can't possibly do that. So one of the big mistakes we made was to not, at the very inception, um, install an energy recovery ventilator. Um, and uh, we talked it over, you know, you're getting towards the end of the project, you're running out of money, and we, don't want to, we didn't want to spend the extra dollars. And, and one of the HVAC guys on site said, oh, you know, you, you open and close doors, you open and close windows, it'll be fine. Any other house I know, they don't need a, you know energy recovery ventilator. He'd never been in a house like this. He'd never lived in a house that is as tight and, and as energy efficient as this. And we had a lot of problems with condensation on the windows uh, during the winter time. And interestingly enough, when we finally decided that you know I'm tired of walking around with a towel every day wiping down my windows, we decided to put an ERV in. Within eight hours, the condensation was gone and it stayed gone. So, you do have yes, we do have one now. Mm -hmm. but, you run it I run it constantly because I don't know why. But I don't think I have to. I think I probably could run it 20 minutes on every hour and it would still be fine. And I still have to experiment with that and find out what it would take, where that balance is to get rid of the condensation and to modulate the interior humidity, but uh, but not necessarily be excessive in my use of electricity. Now, now is that a separate system or is that part of the It's sort of, it, it's, it's a separate system, but it's also tied with this, it's also tied with my existing HVAC system. So, so. would you direct it? I mean, for the homeowner, is it? Well, <laughs> it would have been better if we'd have done it, you know. I lost part of my walk-in closet, which I'm sad about. But, you know, it's, it was for a good cause. I Took one for the Gipper there, yeah. Follow up to that, the, the working on I saw in Vendula here in Nevada, conditioning energy recovery ventilation. So this is a box that will do your heating and your cooling and your ventilation and the whole thing. And they're going to be building a house in very good confidence to put a display house. They don't have the technology yet. But that'd be great. So that'd be one box that'll be modular to use two if you need it. Yeah, that would be, that'd be wonderful. Todd, you had a question. Yeah. Like there's a lot of room for more kind of construction. So what I'm wondering from you is, you know, what do you think it would take to get more? Is it there particular kinds of research gaps? Is there just is it just education or time or what? Bless, bless you, bless you for asking that question. I'm so glad because this is a big frustration of mine. You know, there's there are people enough people within this community that would say, I want to I want to do this because it's the right thing. There, there are people here that would do that because it's the right thing. There are people that would do it because they want something green, they want something energy efficient, and they don't want to be paying, you know, using fossil fuels and paying high heating and cooling bills. But beyond that, I feel like I'm really sort of competing on a very unlevel playing field. And part of the reason for that is the, is the coding system. If, if, if codes are R19 in the walls and, and R30 in the ceiling, most people, most builders are going to build to the minimum of the code. They're not going to build. So I feel like it has to be, uh, uh, we, it has to be approached from a different place rather than sort of the on the ground people. We have to start attacking it from the code because if, <laughs> If we if we raise the standards, then everybody would have to, you know, basically compete to that level. And all this kind of building would become a lot more plausible for a lot more people. I think it's also an educational issue, though. When I really looked at putting up in Orchard Downs, that they would have some different models of 
about building construction and the passive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Catherine talked about some yes. very small portfolio. Yes. Yes. I think people are not, not going to leave them when they've seen them. Right. Right. And there really isn't any reason, in my opinion, that you, that a straw bale house can't also be a passive house at the same time. There might have to be some modifications made. You might have to go to a deeper bale, but it's still it's all possible. And let me also say while I'm thinking about it in terms of just, you know, not just thinking about the United States, but thinking about the whole world. Um, straw bale is something that's being used all over the world. In, in, in Mexico, in Mongolia, a lot of straw bale construction in Mongolia because they have all these open savannas of nothing but, you know, wild grasses that can be baled and they don't have wood and they don't, it, they don't have bricks. So they have got straw bale and they can make, they can make structures. Also, it's simple enough and easy enough that, for instance, just as an idea, in Hurricane Katrina, we ended up with a bunch of trailers that have mold and mildew in them. And, you know, it was a big fiasco. Straw bales, plastered, simple roof over the top, you've got a quick shelter. In developing countries where you don't have a lot of technology, but you need energy efficient, safe, strong housing, places where they're using brick and stone right now in high earthquake zones, this is a really great possibility. So just thinking about it in terms of just the United States, this this particular building material and method has has potential for all across the world. And it's good for us to think about that as well. You want the whole the whole thing to be breathable. That, that, that has to be part of the deal. It can't just be breathable on the inside. It has to be breathable all the way through. So that's why we have, basically, we have a color coat of stucco rather than paint on the outside of the house. And yes, because it doesn't, it doesn't um, deteriorate as quickly because of the silica. It's, it, as a matter of fact, a rice straw is the most desirable straw to use. And one of the reasons is because of the high silica content, a lot of times they can't get rice straw to compost as quickly as they need it to. So they end up, in California, I've heard that they burn 100,000 metric tons of straw every year that could be, instead of being released into the atmosphere in that way, it could be turned into a building material. But, you know, I think the closest that we could get rice straw would be in Arkansas. Isn't that right? They grow rice in Arkansas. I didn't really want to truck my bales from Arkansas. So. What's the life cycle of this house and what happens eventually when it fails or, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say with, I mean, it's, I would say with maintenance, proper maintenance, just like any house, it could last as long as any, any regular house. There, there were uh, incidents of, uh, in Nebraska where straw bale building was born. Um, they had basic simple plasters, and instead of instead of baling a grain crop, which they didn't have, they would they were baling the sweet grass, the native sweet grass prairies. Now those are gone now, but um, uh, one of the barns that was built out of straw bale was sweet grass prairie. It had been plastered with earthen plasters. It was falling down, and the farmer decided. Within, you know, the last 20 years, he decided he was going to tear it down. Well, they started pulling the plaster off the, the bales, and the cows from his pasture came to and started eating the bales. So it was still good to eat, and they were preferring the sweet grass over the stuff that they were eating out in the, the regular, the newly, you know, cultivated pastures. So, you know, straw, if it's not, if it doesn't get soaking wet and it's maintained, it has a potential to last for a long, long time. And I think there was an issue with code officials, and I think we were able to show 100 years. It's the number that sticks in my mind that there were yes. examples that yes. 100 years old. Yes, yes, yeah. So, it, you know, it has the same lifespan as any other. Right, right. And if anybody's worried in terms of this, you know, it would, not to say that it wouldn't be a major issue, but you could theoretically take every bit of straw out there and put all new straw in in 100 years because you still got your structure.